now to speak uh, secondly for the motion, the beautiful game you're having a laugh, is Dominic Lawson. Dominic is a social and political commentator who writes a weekly column for both the uh, column for both the Sunday Times and the independent newspapers. And he'd like to point out that he has written a couple of books on sport. Unfortunately, they were both on chess. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm grateful to Gordon Brown for, for giving me inspiration with his remarks yesterday because I had been looking for a word which sums up the essence of the so-called beautiful game, and that word is bigotry. Um, I, like a lot of uh, you, I was sort of then looking up in the dictionary this word uh, just to check, and the dictionary definition of a bigot is a person obstinately or intolerantly devoted to his or his own. I can't think of a better word for soccer and all, everything that surrounds it. I discovered it about 40 years ago for myself. I was in my school first 11, which looking at me now you may find remarkable, um, and in fact people thought it was remarkable at the time. Um, and uh, the headmaster was a West Ham fan, and every year he would take the first 11 to see his beloved West Ham play, and we went, and that year he took us to a game against Millwall. Uh, I was 11 or 12, uh, and uh, of course Bobby Moore was the captain of West Ham and had three years earlier captured the World Cup for England. He was our hero, and we saw the Millwall fans saying, Bobby Moore takes it up the bum. Now, not being one of the prettier boys at the school, I didn't know what this meant, but, <laughs> but, um, but the headmaster did actually, and it was very sad to see the look on his face. He was very distressed, and he took us all out from the game. Um, and, uh, but going back further than 40 years, uh, Edward II in 1314 actually banned football in London. And what he said is a great noise in the city is caused by hustling over large balls from which many evils may arise, which God forbid. And uh, as you might know, some years later, he was killed by having a poker pushed up his fundamental orifice. And this happened in the vicinity of Millwall. Um, now, it, it's said that the effete middle classes, of which I'm a noted representative, don't, don't understand the male warrior mentality that, uh, that football exemplifies. But actually, it is the least manly of our major sports. If you compare it with the rugby players, when a rugby player gets seriously injured, he shows no pain. He refuses to show pain. If a cricketer is hit by a ball traveling at 90 miles an hour and it hits him in the nether regions, you can see the effort on his face in trying not to show any pain. In contrast, the footballers, they scream, they writhe when they're not even injured at all. In fact, particularly when they're not injured at all. Um, so it's not a manly game. And, of course, they do it to fool the referee. That is the purpose of it. But what is really funny is that though they practice it, they're always outraged when another side does it. Um, and, of course, I understand it. You know, they're teenagers, they're immature. Um, it's forgivable, but it goes right to the top of the game. I mean, the managers, these are grown-ups, apparently, the adult managers. I mean, in the days when I used to watch Match of the Day, one of the reasons why I stopped is I got fed up every game. The losing manager would always whinge and whine about how they'd been unjustly treated. The referee was unfair. In no other sport do you see. You don't see it in rugby. You don't see it in cricket. It's a culture of whinging and whining. And it, by the way, this has nothing to do with class. I mean, if you look at the working men of Welsh rugby in the valleys, they don't whine or whinge, and nor do their supporters. And nor, by the way, by contrast, do they engage in egocentric look-at-me celebrations when they convert a penalty. Now, the question is beauty. We are so beautiful game. I, this is a sort of marketing slogan. I mean, it's a bit like the Ploughman's Lunch was invented by the Brewer's Bass, and everyone thought it was traditional English, the Ploughman's Lunch. It was a marketing campaign in the 1960s. The beautiful game is just a marketing slogan. But what it, where is it actually such a beautiful game? Well, I mean, I think I'm not, I'm not a judge of this, and it's highly subjective, but I think it's quite interesting that in cricket, for example, the attacking sides, the great sides are always attacking sides, and the attacking sides win. So the great sides of the 1970s and 1980s was the West Indian side. It was all about attack. And then in the next generation, the 90s and, and the noughties, it was the Australians, and it was pure attack. It was exhilarating, and it, it, it defeated defense every time. And football is exactly the opposite. If you think about it, I mean, remember what happened. It's, it's always... It's usually the Germans 
with their sort of automaton-style play, who beat the beautiful teams. Remember what happened to Holland in the 1982 World Cup, for example, or actually, Hunter, you'll remember this as if it were yesterday, um, Hungary in 1954. Um, <laughs> um, the team of Pushkas, beaten by the Germans again. Um, in fact, Hungary beat Germany 8-3 in the qualifying stages, but you see, that didn't count either. It's, it's about the panzer tank steamrolling to victory over the artists. Now, the last game of football I went to, in fact, which finally settled it for me, was a World Cup match also. It was England against Tunisia in Marseille in 1998, and I was standing behind the goal along with the England supporters. And I suddenly realized how little they themselves could be enjoying what they'd all paid so much to see. All I could hear were constant shouts of abuse and outrage. And when I turned round, all I could see were faces twisted with anguish and more often fury. And then after the game, I saw these people chasing North Africans through the streets of Marseille, throwing bottles at them. And the rioting lasted for three days. And we'd actually won the game. <laughs> now, is it a complete coincidence that football attracts bigots in such numbers? Or is there something about the whole structure of the game and how it is played that creates and encourages bigotry? I believe it is the latter, that football is an ugly game, that Edward II was right, and that you should support the motion.